Welcome to Agile Roots 2010, sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Vario, Amirsis, Agile Alliance, and Xmission Internet. Systems Thinking and the Learning Organization by Jason Dean. Well, good morning, actually afternoon, everyone. My name is Jason, and if you went to the presentation we had yesterday, about on the cycles of your brain and your body during the day, this is the actual worst possible time you could be here. So uh, I'll do my best to keep you awake, and uh, if I get boring, I, I have my permission to say, this sucks. So everybody practice, ready? This sucks. Good, so that's our, that's our agreement. I won't take it against you, and uh, we'll go from there. My name again is Jason, and I'm at Agile consultant by trade. I do training and consulting, and uh, it's a relatively new business, so I uh, just enjoy the opportunity to do it, mostly in the adoption space, so working with uh, companies who've never done Agile before, mostly. Uh, a lot of experience in the uh, traditional PMI world, as it were, and I've been a coder and a tester and a business analyst and a project manager and various size of teams and companies, so I really enjoy uh, what Agile has today uh, to offer for us. Systems thinking is what I'm going to be talking about today, and uh, unabashedly I've stolen everything for this talk directly out of Peter Senge's book. How, how many people have read this book? Peter Senge, The Fifth Discipline. This is a must read. This is classic business uh, literature, but I think it goes way beyond just the general organizational management uh, person. It goes, uh, has a lot of application for all of us. So that's where I'm gonna be taking a lot of this information today and I highly encourage you to get a copy of that. My supposition is that great software is only possible in a learning organization. There's lots of different you know, uh, ideas about what a learning organization is. Uh, we're gonna look at a couple different ideas here. I don't know if this turner is going to work. We'll see. Wow. So a learning organization, and, and uh, that might be kind of small, but I'll just kind of talk through it with you. Um, <clears throat> what is a learning organization? Well, a learning organization, at least according, according to Peter Senge, is a place where people are continually expanding their capacity to create. Um, I think we can see some media value in that. Their capacity to create obviously directly impacts your ability to deliver value, and that's what Agile should be all about, at least. Uh, but we're talking about getting the results you really want out of their organization. Wouldn't you like to live in a place or work in a place where thinking is nurtured and you're rewarded for that. You know, where you get to uh, pursue this collective aspiration, working together. Now, I know that in the Agile world, that's definitely something we're, we're trying to pattern, we're trying to build, we're trying to do that with pair programming, we're trying to do that with uh, some of these different roles that we've established for Scrum, for example. It's a place where people are continually learning how to learn together. So a learning organization is, is not something you achieve, right? A learning organization is something that, that you constantly or continually doing. So what's wrong with the current system? Why, why do we need learning organizations? Well, I think Deming said it pretty well here. Our prevailing system of management is destroying our people. People are born with intrinsic motivation, self-respect, dignity, curiosity to learn, and joy in learning. I don't think a lot has changed since he made that statement. But very few organizations that I've worked in really focus on my success. And, have a, and, and how many times have you been encouraged to succeed for the sake of others around you? We're encouraged to succeed to get the job done. But is it more than that? I, I hope that it is. And I, this highlighted part, destroying our people, this is why I do Agile. I don't do Agile because I just think it's something fun. I do it because I think you're valuable. I think that people are valuable. And I think that Agile restores respect 
for people, you know, and that interaction between people. Maybe that's idealistic, but hey, I'm an idealistic kind of guy. So I think that Agile has a lot to say about that. You know, we've seen a lot of short-term thinking of supplying the same rules across the organization, no matter who you are or what kind of project it is, measuring the wrong things, controlling, managing by fear. So <clears throat> the first step I really uh, think about uh, when we think about uh, a learning organization is how do we create that? I mean, it doesn't happen by accident. Nothing good happens by accident, right? So we're going to have to build that uh, organization ourselves, and it's going to take some hard work. A lot of it has to do with this idea of creating and changing realities. Businesses are essentially are the sum of their decisions. It makes sense. It's not rocket science. The decisions, the culture, the ethos, the interactions that we've been talking about, their visions and goals. This system that the company has built has created uh, its own situation, has created its own reality. It's really easy to complain about the problems that we have, but if we'll stop and think about it for a moment, they're there because of us, right? So if they're going to change, they're gonna to have to change because of us. Now sure, we have external forces acting upon us, and those can create problems internally, but what I'm really talking about is our ability to learn, our ability to grow, our ability to be more than we are today, right? So <clears throat> these decisions, this culture that we've built, have really caused things to be the way they are. Uh, Peter talks about in his book here, he says that system structure leads to patterns of behavior, which is, which is sounds uh, pretty logical, doesn't it? System uh, structures, the way that we've built the organization leads to these patterns of behaviors, which lead to events. But what are we always trying to fix in the organization? We're always trying to fix events, right? We're fixing the fact that the project is late. We've got not, we don't have enough resources. There's these, these events that happen. And so we're always focused on the uh, particular problem of the day. But what the point here is, is that it point, there's something else behind that. And that's really the purpose of this whole talk today, is to say that the problems that we experience, the things that we go through, the structure of our system, in our organization is a result of behaviors that we've learned, behaviors that we've taken on because we were trained there, expectations of our culture, and they relate to these system structures that we continually either build up or tear down or add to. Um, Peter talks about this idea of a metanoia, which means a change of mind. He related it to, like the early Gnostic Christians would call this word repent. It means to turn around and go, it's, it's to change your way of thinking. He's saying that there needs to be a, a revolution in the way we think, that we're not just thinking of the small pieces. Now, as good engineers, we're trained to break apart everything, aren't we? We take apart the big problem and make it smaller problems, and then we take apart those smaller pieces and break them apart further so we can try to get down to root cause. These kinds of activities we do all the time, and yet, when we do that, we wind up losing something. We lose the ability to see the whole system. And I think that's the real value for Agile. That's the something that, that I think we miss often, at least in, in uh, companies where there aren't people sort of dedicated to looking at that system. Maybe they're a manager, a project manager maybe, or a business manager. But, the problem so often is not just that event that happened, but there's a systemic reason, right? And we can think about this technically. We know what a systemic problem is. It's not just a, a data problem. It's not just a, a little defect. It's, it's, it's a result of the architecture of the system, okay? So he says that we need a metanoia. We need to recreate ourselves, and this is how we're going to be able to really uh, make a difference and, and learn and be in that place that we really want to be. Structure and patterns that control events. And my, what I'm saying to you is that those agile patterns that we're talking about, those can be our structure, and that can enable us to be a true learning organization. 
And that's what I say here. Agile provides a framework from which a learning organization can be built. So my proposal is that Agile is not only good for building software, but it's good for building organizations. It's good for building interactions between people. You know, uh, we just heard from Alistair talking about those interactions. That's, that exactly is where the meat is at. In Agile we have, you know, maybe we use a, a card on a wall. It represents a conversation, right? That's what, that's what we need Agile for in our organizations to help us find ways to have more conversations so we can break down those barriers between those organizations. We've all experienced that IT business uncomfortableness. I was at HP, worked there for a number of years, and I was on an R&D team, and I managed requirements for a remote delivery team, offshore team, and they combined us, they did a reorg, and they combined us with a marketing group. And I just thought that was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. You know, and it was so strange. We had, you know, really geeky guys, technical, techno freaks, you know, sitting next to these marketing guys who knew nothing about the technology underneath the software they were getting. What I found was it started a conversation. All of a sudden, I knew why we were building those things that we needed. Now, in Agile, we, we know that that's a good thing. We, we talk about customers sitting with us or going to the customer's location. So we know that that's a good thing. But I propose that we use Agile to do more than just deliver value in software. I, I propose that we use it to deliver value in the organization. So there's three main core learning disciplines grouped into these five uh, uh, learning disciplines that uh, Senge talks about. Fostering aspiration, this three-legged stool of fostering, fostering aspiration, understanding complexity, and developing reflective conversation. So I'm gonna try to move through these pretty quick. My goal here is not that you try to get everything that I talk about, because uh, there's just a lot in this space. I, if you're at all interested in this, you know, I'll give you some more information, but I just want you to be listening for keys that might help you think at a broader level. Our responsibility, our social responsibility, in my opinion, on this earth is to expand our circle. You know, we all have a little circle around us, and this is where I live. This is my space. I, I control my thoughts and actions, and I think about me and my needs, and I eat and I sleep. And, that circle is very small and when we you know can draw that bigger circle around our family we're doing things for our family and with our family and we're able to help more people so i'm encouraging you and i'm encouraging me to draw that circle bigger in our organization develop partnerships use these tools to help you think about the bigger picture we're going to start with the, the concept of systems thinking but we'll go through these other ones as well Systems thinking. So here's a, an example of a system. When it rains, we don't always think about the fact of, of the whole system behind it, right? We just think, man, I need some new windshield wipers on my car, right? We're, we're just thinking about the rain or it's getting my hair wet or whatever. But we know that there's a bigger system. There's rain that goes into the groundwater, into the rivers and creeks, into the ocean, and, to the, and evaporates up into the clouds, and then it rains again. So we know the, the water cycle, right? So it's part of a system. It would be a mistake for us to think that rain just comes from the clouds because, you know, if we do things that, that uh, damage our groundwater, that's going to cause an effect on the, the, the whole system. So we realize that there's a lot more than just one event. Systems thinking is about holistic thinking. I just got back from China and I loved it because they're very holistic thinkers. You know, and I had some good... Uh, sweet and sour fish, the head is on one end and the tail is on the other, you know, and, and they think that that looks nice because it's a good presentation, it's the whole animal, it's, it's holistic thinking. You don't eat those parts unless you want to, but, uh, you know, you pick the meat off the fish and, and that's, the, that's the meal. So they're used to thinking in broader concepts, but some of the parts and their interactions, that's what a system is, interrelated actions, and again, more specifically, interrelated interactive conversations between components of the system. People are active participants in shaping their future in a system, right? People are participating, making decisions. This concept of dynamic complexity that we can't just say uh, 
there's one main reason. Sometimes there is one main reason for something, but many times we know that, that there's a lot of other parts of the system that has an effect on what's going on. But so often we want to blame somebody, right? We want to blame the developer for writing a core code, or we want to blame IT because they clearly can't, you know, don't know our, our business needs. So it's easy to try to blame someone, but really there's this dynamic complexity. There's detail complexity. Sure, there's little details uh, that we need to understand and know, but there, there's this dynamic complexity about how all the parts of the system work together. And there's this concept of circles of causality, which is very interesting. If you can see that picture, essentially, you know, if you start with the faucet, turn the faucet on, right? Water fills up the cup. It's flowing into the cup, and the water level's going up. My brain is seeing that with my eyes, right? I'm, I'm registering a perceived gap between the desired water level, right? I want a full glass of water, but not all the way to the top, a quarter inch below the top. So I'm looking for that. And when that water level approaches, I turn it off, right? So here we have a cycle. We have a system. Now, we would typically describe it in that fashion. We would say, I turn on the water. It fills up. When I see that it's level I want, I turn it off. But you can also describe this in the reverse. The water level affects the faucet position through the perception. It can go the other direction as well. And so we don't often think about it from that way. Right? We're just thinking about it from the fact that I'm controlling my hand. But really, it's the water level controlling my hand. Right? So this is just a simple example. And those arrows represent influences. So your, your perceptions influence that faucet position and water flow influence, or the uh, water flow is an influence. So <clears throat> this is a system. Now, in Senge's book, which I encourage you to dig into when you have time, he, he goes through several different archetypes. And I think these are really valuable for you to look at. There's this first one I'm just giving as an example, but it's limits to growth. And essentially what you have is two loops. You have this reinforcing loop, and you have this balancing loop. Okay? So in this example, you have a production, uh, flexibility, and cost. And that influences our commitment to just-in-time delivery, right? So, uh, and of course, that just-in-time delivery affects or influences our production flexibility and cost. Having the right stuff there at the right time, you know, influences our ability to, to produce more. On the other side, the balancing side, the left, that left side is the growth side. The reinforcing is the growth, okay? But on the left side, we have uh, the right side, sorry, the, is the balancing loop. Well, that commitment to the to just in time threat has a causes or influences the manufacturer, doesn't it? The manufacturer has a goal. He wants to maintain multiple sources because he doesn't want to be left high and dry. Okay, but the supplier, you know, he wants to be the sole source. There's a risk to the supplier. There's a delay between when we see the actual results happen, and that affects negatively our ability to have just in time delivery. So the point here is, is that there's, there's this reinforcing loop. There's things that cause things to go well and to grow. And you can have reinforcing of negatives as well, right? And then there's things that balance. Why is this important? Because when you're looking at a problem in your organization, when you're looking at a problem in your system, you need to realize that there's things that cause it to grow and there's things that cause it to be limited. Now, the, the what, what do we normally do? If there's something that we want to grow, we push harder, right? Push harder on that thing to make it grow. We're gonna train people more, we're gonna do all these things to make it go faster and faster and faster. But in actuality, we need to be looking at the other side. We need to be looking at, at this, this uh, limiting factor, that manufacturer's goal is a limiting factor. We need to address that. If we can reduce the limiting factor, then all of a sudden, we've opened up our system to growth, right? Well, what is this? We know this as theory of constraints. That's exactly what this is. So Agile is already doing systems work, OK? That's, that's a, that kind of the corollary part of this talk, is that when we use Agile, we're actually implementing systems thinking in our organization. But when we want to try to, in this case, 
reduce that limiting factor, then we're opened up. It's the same thing about saving money. You know, we can make more money by saving it, right? System thinking then integrates some other learning disciplines which we're gonna look at. The idea of personal mastery, shared vision, mental models, dialogue, and team learning. We'll get to those. Again, this idea of a metanoia. We've been trained to break things down, but we need to think differently. How, what does Agile offer for us? How is Agile implementing this already? Well, we see here just a few things. Value stream, right? We know what a value stream is. It's a flow of value within the organization, within the system, supplier to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Flow, flow Im implies a system. Pull from a customer implies a system. Team ownership, right? We have a, a team that owns code, not just one person. So I can code on anything in the system because a team owns it, okay? No individual ownership, slicing of information instead of, uh, instead of just having a component, okay? So Agile's already doing some of these things, uh, which I think is good. And that's why I'm proposing that Agile is a good tool to use for helping your organization be a learning organization. Now I'm gonna go through these just real uh, briefly because there's a lot here and we just don't have time. But again, we talked about this concept that today's problems came from yesterday's solutions, right? I mean, so we know about refactoring, we, we know about technical debt. Does anybody have any technical debt, <coughs> right? So we know that tomorrow's problems are coming from the things that we're building today. If that's the case, how should we be building the things that we're building today? Now with Agile, we're not thinking about everything that could possibly happen. We're not planning for 100 years down the line or you know, a long time away. We're planning for a short time horizon. But we need to be thinking beyond than just the, just the next iteration a little bit. We need to be thinking, how's our customer going to use this? And what do they want to use next? What are our competitors doing? As a developer, it was very helpful for me to know not only how my customers were using my software, but how the organization was going to be uh, moving in that application space. You know, why invest a bunch of time in something that isn't going anywhere? So I don't go and do a bunch of uh, cleanup, maybe, in a particular part of the system that really isn't going to go anywhere. So having a systems thinking perspective, it can be very helpful. Another uh, thing that I've seen a lot in Agile and in, uh, uh, at Scrum teams is that things go really great. They adopt Agile, they start doing well, and they, they start getting some great velocity, and they start delivering, and everyone gets excited, right? And then what happens? It starts trailing off, they're not quite as concerned about it anymore, and the developers are kind of not really wanting to pair anymore, and, and, the, and the, the management is thinking, well, there's, we did that already, what, what else do we need to do? You know, so that you see this kind of great excitement, and then things kind of taper off. Um, that's what happens in general in systems, right? The behavior gets better before it gets worse. So if we know that's gonna happen, what are we doing about that? What are we doing to ensure that we're continuing to motivate people, train people, prepare people? How do we integrate the IT and, and business better so that we don't have these weird situations where they show up and say, I've got to have this tomorrow, I don't care what your process is. You know? I don't care what it breaks in his, in his bucket of stuff, I just care about my bucket of stuff. How many, as a project manager, I can't tell you how many times you know, a program manager came to me and said, I gotta have this done. Right? And I don't blame them, they're, they're under the gun. But what about the other program managers that I was delivering for? They had the same you know, uh, needs as well. <laughs> An easy way out leads, the easy way out often leads back in, right? It's like the story of the, the drunk guy, he's under his, the light out in front of his house, and he's looking for his keys, and, or he's looking around on the ground, and somebody says, what are you looking for? Looking for your keys. Well, where did you leave them? Well, I dropped them by the door. Well, what are you looking here for? Well, there's no light by the door, <laughs> right? So, you know, it's just this, this whole concept that it's easy to do what's familiar, 
But if you're a learning organization, you're constantly putting yourself in a new light. You're looking at yourself, you're introspecting, you're retrospecting. That's why we do retrospective, so we can learn, so we can grow. But when we stop learning, that's when systems begin to take over because the harder you push, it'll push back, unless you're doing things to prevent that. Faster is slower, we know that. Sometimes, you know, we, we do agile thinking that we're just doing it for speed. And yeah, sometimes we can get speed, depending on the system. But, you know, faster is slower in the sense that unless we're thinking ahead, unless we're committing to these things that we're doing, um, it can cause problems, right? We're, if we're, we're exchanging the long term for the short term. stuff, but I like it anyway. So another big problem that we have is cause and effect are not connected always in time, right? In other words, just because we do something in one sprint doesn't mean we're going to see the results in the next. It may be much further down the, lo the line before we realize the, that code we should have refactored is now causing some major problems, okay? So there's this delay, but if we don't think about the fact that there's a delay, we just go happily on our way and we never, we're not looking at the rest of the system, looking for those delays. Now, we know from the lean perspective that we're always trying to get rid of those delays, right? Because those delays cause uh, things to be covered up, cause them to be hidden. And when they're hidden, what happens? Then you have defects that show up at the end, that came out of nowhere, that are nasty, that you can't ship because of this defect. When we should have known about it already. So I'm just going to, that, that's basically, you know, this systems thinking is this concept of looking at the whole picture. But really we need to take it and apply it to the whole organization and not just, and even for the person living on the Agile team, your tester living on a team, or an architect, or developer, the things you do should be connected to the things that company is doing. When I go to implement Agile in some place, I start with value stream mapping, right? I start at the top. What are you trying to do as a business? What's your strategic goals? And by the time we're done, their backlog is connected directly to their strategic goals. So that as a developer, I'm sitting on a team, I know that this task that I'm doing right now actually is delivering value to the strategic goals of my company, right? But we don't often do that. So we wind up doing all this work, lots and lots of work all the time, that in the end just gets thrown away because we're not looking at it from the broader perspective. So we're gonna talk about personal mastery. <clears throat> personal mastery is this concept of expanding our own ability to produce the results we want in life. You know, it has to do with, with self-learning, but it has a lot more, uh, there's a lot more to it than that. I encourage you to read the book. There's a ton of information around this, but. I want results in my life. What's important to you? What do you want out of life? You know, not very long ago, I, I essentially left corporate America to start my own business because I was tired of someone else determining my priorities for me. I was tired of somebody else telling me what my dreams are. I didn't want to work 12 hours a day building printers. You know, it's just not that important to me. It's not that it's not necessary. I'm glad there are people building printers because I use them. But that's not what makes me satisfied at the end of the day. So I wanted to be on my own so that I could pursue my own goals, my own dreams. What's important to you? How are you growing? How are you learning? The basic idea here is that you as an individual must learn before the organization can learn. Doesn't that make sense? As an organization, we try to say, well, we need to move into this space. You gotta move into this market space. Well, we're not gonna actually invest in any training. We're not going to invest in, in hiring people that know that space, or we're not going to invest in giving people time, like on Fridays, to build code in that area, to explore it. We're just going to have do things the way we've always done it. But as an individual, if we don't learn, how in the world is the organization going to learn? So you have to learn first. Well, gosh, if you have to learn something, then as a manager, what's my job? My job is to make you the best that you can be. Why don't our companies do that, you know? So I think Agile has the opportunity to, again, lift people up and help them be important because why? They're a part of the decision process. 
They're a part of, of making choices, right? So they're empowering people to, to have something uh, in their life that satisfies. Because if you're just working to get paid, that doesn't really satisfy. Now it might for a time, <coughs> but it doesn't last. Excuse me. <clears throat> so where does this start? It starts with personal vision. This is really good for me, I like this. An ability to focus on intrinsic desires. What do you really want? What are you pursuing in your life? As a developer, in your code base, what are you pursuing? Are you pursuing just getting the job done? Are you pursuing knowing more about it? Being better at what you do? Are you pursuing being better for other people? Right? Are you pursuing those relationships with others that make you a better coder? Because in the end, you know why I'm building the software. Okay? So an ability to focus on the intrinsic desires, oh, thank you, is, is really critical, and this is where it starts. People seeking mastery, personal mastery, are continually doing these two things, clarifying what's important, okay, and learning, look, looking, learning about what is real. When I went on my own, started my own business, it became immediately apparent that there was a lot of things I didn't know, right? Is that gonna stop me? No, because I know some things, and there's a few people in the world that know a little bit less than what I do, so I try to find those and, and help them. <laughs> now there's a whole bunch of other people who know way more than me, and so I go to places like this to learn from them, and to try to be part of them, and be a part of their story. You know, we all have a story, we all have something uh, that brought us where we are, are we a part of that for someone else? Are we seeking to really see where we are? Are we introspecting to say, what, are, what is important to me? What's important to our organization? Is it all these other fringe things? Is there a core business that we should be focusing on? Are we building our people? So continually clarifying what's important, continually learning to see reality. Well, isn't this what we do in Agile? This is what we do all the time, if we're doing it right. We're always looking back, and we're always looking ahead. We're saying, how can we do this better? What opportunities for improvement do we have? How can I work better with this guy who's totally different than me? Now, if I have a mature attitude, I'm gonna sit down with that guy that I don't really like, and I'm gonna find a way to, to have some, some common bound or some common space, some common ground that I can get better at. Great story of this when I was at HP. I sat next to this guy, really, really sharp guy, but really blunt, you know? I mean, he was just kind of rude, you know? Everyone thought he was rude. He came across as rude, grumpy, you know? Was he in constant pain all the time? I couldn't really tell. There was something, you know, seemed wrong with the person. And it, you know, I'm just normally kind of an outgoing person, and, and it kind of just didn't sit well with me. But I wasn't, I had to, I had to work with him. I had to sit next to him and I wasn't willing to let that lay. And so I, I found out just real quickly that it wasn't that he's rude, it's just that he's interested in the bottom line. He's interested in the details. He's not really interested in all the fluff. And once I found that out, I was able to say, here you go, here's what, here's what you need. Here's the bottom line. One sentence, I delivered what I needed to deliver to him. And then all of a sudden, he, was, he loved to talk about fishing, you know, and race cars and building rockets. And, you know, the, all of a sudden, the whole door opened up to this guy because I learned a little bit about who he was and what he needed. Well, if we can, in our organizations, apply the same rule and say, what is the core thing we need to do? Then we can deliver those things first, and the rest opens up to us. I, I mentioned yesterday to a couple people that I read a proverb a day or so ago that said, once we have understanding, basic understanding of how the system is working, then we get knowledge. In other words, we start to see the real issues. But unless you know how the system is flowing, unless you know how uh, you can grow, and what's holding you back from growing, what are those limiting factors? How, how can you see? So these things help us have knowledge about our system, help us to learn uh, more about what's happening. So it's this idea of moving from where we are to where we want to be. This vision, 
And so there's a gap. We feel the gap. We think we need to be better in these things. Uh, it says really small in there. It didn't zoom in like I wanted, but there's this concept of creative tension. We talked a little bit about a couple other sessions yesterday about conflict in the team. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But creative tension is this idea that I'm stretching forward, trying to grab hold of something, and there's other things holding me back. So what's the, see, this, the best way to move forward is to release those things holding me back. Because I'm already motivated, man. I'm already, I'm already going places. I know what I want. I know how I need to move forward. But there's these, these things holding me back. Sometimes there are other people. So I need to work with those people. Sometimes they're the business owner. Because, you know, I never can understand anything he tells me. <laughs> how am I supposed to build that? I don't even know what you're asking. Have I taken the time to ask? Realizing that there's conflict, you know, this is, this is a, it's kind of interesting. Many times we think we can't learn, we can't do something new because we are powerless. We think that we don't have any power to do that. We think that we're worthless, that we don't actually deserve that. He says in his book, you guys can just kind of listen along. He says, I can create, if, if you were to say this out loud and say, I can create my life exactly the way I want it. In all dimensions, work, family, relationships, community, and the whole world. Do you believe you have the power to do that? Do you feel like you're worthy to do that? So what's holding you back? You know, there's lots of opportunities in your own organization to overcome obstacles if you'll do it. If you'll reach out and be vulnerable. It's hard because you might, you know, we're afraid, right? We're afraid someone's going to find out we don't know as much as we pretend that we know. So we overcome conflict by committing to the truth and this des relentless desire to root out our limits. And then this next step is driving it to the subconscious, right? I want it to be part of my autonomic system. I don't have to think about all the things that have to happen for me to scratch my head. My brain does. It does thousands of steps for me to scratch my head, but I didn't have to think about that. So we can drive these things into our autonomic Right? The things that happen automatically. Things like sitting down with someone and asking what they think. That seems so obvious. But when, sometimes when you're focused and you're trying to get it done, you don't do that. And in the end, your quality is worse. So how does Agile help? It gives importance to interaction, iteration, and incremental discovery. We're learning, we're growing. This is what is good for an organization. This is why I want to see organizations do Agile, not just because they deliver software value uh, frequently, but because it gives them discovery opportunities. That's why I like short sprints, because you get to practice more, right? Conversation and collaboration, relying on uh, personal and team craftsmanship, personal accountability, transparency, and multiple perspectives. Have you ever heard of the, the three blind men and the elephant? You probably have. This blind man was told to reach out and feel. He didn't, you know, they didn't tell him what it was. And then one guy was feeling the, the, the tail, and he said, well, it feels like a rope. Another guy was feeling his leg, and said, well, it feels like a tree. Another guy was feeling the side, and it feels like a wall. And they were all right, and they were all wrong. It was all the same thing. It was one animal. But they had different perspectives, right? They had a different... Um, way of seeing things. Well, you're in a cross-functional team. You have people around you that see things from a different perspective. You need their perspectives. But we sit there and we just do our little job. And we don't think about the value that we could get if we would open up, which is a scary thing to do sometimes. <clears throat> I'm really, really behind. Shared vision is about what we want to create. It's having this one picture. The interesting thing about shared vision, that it's built from your personal vision. Okay, now just picture this. If everyone in this room has their own personal vision about what's the best, like the, the example we did with Alistair, the best word, best name, but we had to come together with a shared vision. We voted, mindset was the top one. So our personal visions apply into the shared vision, and now we're all a little better off because of a shared vision. We can all buy into it, right? Talk a little bit more about this in a second, but 
The interesting thing is, is that Maslow, have you heard of Maslow's hierarchy of need? Right? The base level is survival. The top is, is self-fulfillment. The things that we do can be so completely ingrained that they cannot be separated from us. In other words, they become, they get forced down through to the lower level. So in other words, my ability to communicate and to, to bring in other people's perspectives, if I can drive that down to my core need, I don't have to think about it anymore. If my organization automatically pursues diverse ideas, and then in our scrum team, I'm automatically asking, okay, I've heard that idea, who has a different idea? Who has another way to do it? And I, as a scrum master, I wouldn't leave until we had at least three ways to do something. And then we would talk about what the best way was. Interrelationships require common understanding. There's different kinds of commitments we make to one another. Sometimes it's more of just signing up, I'm enrolling. Sometimes I'm doing it because I have to, I'm compliant. Sometimes I just don't want to. There's different kinds of compliance, of course. If you want people to invest in you, guess what? You have to invest in them. If you're gonna have people that are committed to helping you deliver, let's say the business person is helping you deliver good stories, guess what? You're gonna have to be committed to them and not just give them a bunch of fluff and excuses when something doesn't happen. You take responsibility as a team, you take accountability as a team, you succeed as a team, you fail as a team. But you live in openness and transparency with those who depend on you, right? Be honest and genuine. You can't make people join to, to, to connect with you. You have to reach out to connect to them. It's your responsibility, not theirs. Reflective conversation has this idea of mental models. To sum this up is, mental model is your worldview. How do you see things? What's your perspective? Which part of the elephant are you holding on to? And then have you shared that with somebody? Because you're writing a piece of code that you think that elephant's just a little rope. And it's not. I think the thing that's really important about all this, this, whole, this whole area is that in our organization, we need to create ways for people to learn. Google does this. They'll give people Fridays or every other Friday, something like that, right, to do what they want to do. They can do anything they want. It has to be a, you know, some kind of productive project. It can be, it doesn't have to be within the organization. But something that they're learning and growing and, and building the company up. Why? Because it brings that diversity in, right? It brings that culture of inquiry to the table. The worst thing I hate to see is a, a group of developers sitting around a table and no one says anything. Now, I know why that happens because there's lots of times they're just introspective people or you know they're not as, as loud and obnoxious as I am. So they don't just automatically talk. They like to think first. But everyone has something to say. say. Everyone has something to share. You've got a background. You've learned some things. Be willing to share it. Be willing to explore and, and, and uh, enjoy that diversity of thought around you. Different world views. Just gonna move forward here. Team learning. We're trying to go somewhere. That's that big arrow, right? We're trying to get somewhere. Well, what usually happens is this, right? That's what happens. Why? It happens because we don't talk to each other. We don't, and when we do, we're not really connecting and we don't really care, <laughs> right? What should it look like? It should look like this. But that takes work. Are you willing to do the work? I hope so. Having real dialogue with one another. Conflict. I love conflict. Conflict is an opportunity. I hate conflict in the sense of arguing with somebody, but conflict is an opportunity for you to do something better, right? If I have a conflict with someone from another country because of my ideological positions, I have an opportunity to learn from them. If you have a conflict of what, what the code should look like, you have an opportunity to learn from someone and to share it. But it requires these different ideas. Doesn't it make sense that if we're gonna to come together, that we have, uh, we have our own passions, our own ideas, and this, that can create conflict, but that's, Good that we have differing ideas, right? 
It helps us be better. We need to learn to practice together as a team. So these are some basic, basic concepts about learning organizations, okay? Personal mastery, shared vision, mental models, team learning, systems thinking. I think Agile is a great pattern for that. I encourage you to dig into it, find out how Agile is making you better, but also how thinking about the whole system can make your Agile better as well. So good luck. Thank you very much.